recommend that you do so. Uh, it will tie everything in together and make a little more sense of what you're going to hear today. We know this as the story of the prodigal son. And guys, much is made out of the, of the story, and in all fairness, rightly so. Some of the things that we discussed over the past couple of weeks was the fact that I have never felt as if this was a parable, a fictitious story, the Lord was using. Now, your heretics, your Bible haters and correctors will metaphoricalize everything. They'll say this was just a story. Uh, it was just a, a, a made up event, a metaphor uh, to cover a blanket of what could happen, ideologies and this and that. I don't believe that to be, uh, to be true at all. Jesus never said that it was a parable, number one. I believe this is an actual, true, and factual event that occurred that Jesus Christ was speaking about to his disciples. The second thing is, is that the Lord, his graciousness, shrouded the name of this family, covered it up, and kept it away from the eternal record for all of us today, because so often, many times, uh, our name is linked to the actions and the events that we have committed. If someone thinks about Jezebel, she's a vile, vicious, wicked, devilish woman, uh, some he thinks about Judas. He's a betrayer. Uh, he's a betrayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he is a devil. I mean, you don't know anybody today naming their children Hymenaeus and things like that because they are equated with people of betrayal, people of sin, people of wickedness. So God, in his gracious, infinite wisdom, shrouded the name of this family so that that shame, that embarrassment, and I know that we don't want to, we don't like to use that word embarrassment. We know this father and his family was hurt, injured. Uh, they're spiritually, they were broken emotionally they were torn apart but at the end of the day they were still embarrassed of what that child had done we know that to be true because of human nature doesn't matter it doesn't make him any less of a man and it doesn't remove any more any uh, love that he has for this son at all but the reality is we know that's the truth god in his perfect infinite wisdom covered the name of this family so that it would not go down into the eternal record to forever be known by the betrayal of their younger brother We've earmarked him the prodigal. And there, there is, across the globe, we have found that sermons have been preached, altar call pleas have been made. We've heard sermons preached around the story. We've, we've seen song services as well as the evangelists get up behind the pulpit screaming in jubilation from behind the eyes of the son's father. We're not really certain of how long this young man was out in the wickedness of the world. We have no idea necessarily. We cannot pinpoint it, whether it was six days or six years for that matter. I will bring your, your attention to a verse that we've read here. If you look there in verse uh, 29, when the older brother was a bit irritated, and he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. So there's a, uh, there's a hint that it could have been many years that the younger brother had wandered out into the sea of sin. However, nevertheless, he could be referring to his lifetime that he's been there before the brother left and afterwards. So again, we don't know a definitive time. Why do we not know that? Again, God's infinite wisdom, because you know how we are. If had it been six years, had it been six months, had it been six weeks, somebody would sit back and they say, hey, listen, I can play around for X amount of days, X amount of months, X amount of years, all coming back to this prodigal son. There's several applications to be had from this scripture, many illustrations, doctrinal establishments, found within the 21 verses depicting the events of this young man. We've seen this man who, who leaves his home uh, with his inheritance, traveling into a far-off land to live according to the flesh. He reaps a crop uh, that he sows uh, just as later on the Apostle Paul will earmark in Galatians 6, 7, uh, saying that you reap what you sow. Finally, the young man hits rock bottom while he's feeding along the, alongside the swine in filth, and he comes to his right mind. He repents and goes home to dad, and the, the father greets him. Gives him a robe, a ring, rejoices by way of throwing a party. What a blessing. Now he's home. He's home. He's reunited with family. And yes, there's a bit of a rough patch here with the, over the celebration from the older brother. And it's understandable. But all in all, generally speaking, this is where we typically leave the story. We typically go from, and I understand it ends in verse 32. We typically leave off and never give it another thought. And can I say this, guys? We tend to treat the events of Luke 15 with the prodigal son, we tend to treat it like a Hallmark movie. 
where a situation arises, a problem is presented, a hero emerges, and all is well in the world. Now, this is the part we hear about. This is the part that is presented. We see how the young man was drawn away by his own lust through the appeal of the world, the terrible lifestyle he, uh, that follows, the repercussions thereof, and finally the grand return and repentance with celebration to follow. And let me say this first and foremost this morning before we get any further, guys. Praise the Lord for his return, his repentance, and his rejoicing which ensued. Praise God for that. I, I, will, I am not uh, uh, demonizing that. I'm not minimizing that by any stretch of the imagination. Again, I've said this a minute ago. Men have preached this event around the globe for centuries. We've heard sermons even about the, the brother who was upset because of the party, and many a message has focused on the inheritance of both sons. Men have given devotions on the father's great love, his compassion, and his forgiveness. But this morning, I want to pose a different thought to you. I want to bring something to you concerning the younger brother uh, who remembered and returned home. I wonder if there were days that he had gone back. You know, it's a tremendous blessing to see these events play out. I mean, it gives us the assurance of the Lord's long suffering as supported in Hebrews 13, 5. I'll never leave you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That is a tremendous blessing that we can draw from the events of the prodigal son. But the confidence we gain in the events of Luke 15 are, are equal to the conviction which should be within every single child of God who reads this chapter. I mean, beloved, there is a part of every prodigal's life too many fail to consider. And I say this because many of immature Christians has wandered out willingly into the sea of sin with the very simple thought, I can go out if I want to, but I can always come back because of the prodigal son in Luke 15. That's the danger of highlighting the sinful lifestyle. Guys, I, I praise God for wonderful testimonies and praise the Lord for the prodigals. Guys, I'm not saying anything about that, amen. But I'll tell you what, when a preacher or an evangelist can't get past uh, what he preaches and, and keeps bringing up his sinful, wicked lifestyle to draw the emotions of the men, he's a shallow preacher, and all he's doing is highlighting the wickedness of his own flesh, and some young bug boy or girl is going to sit in the back of the pews, and they're going to hear that. They're going to say, he did it, I can do it, and I'll be okay. And I got news from you, nine out of ten of those who go out of the sea of the sin never return, and most of them end up dead in early life. So I want to bring this thought to you today. I mean, I want to bring this thought that I hope it rocks your bones to the core. There's a part of this young man's life which is not recorded. And even though we do not read about it, even though we do not see it on the pages, doesn't mean it didn't happen. We can all agree that this young man is human, right? He's not an animal. He's not a turtle. He's not a jackrabbit. He's a human boy. Amen. He's a man. And therefore, if he's a human, we can all agree that he has human nature, just like you and I, just like each and every one of us. So with all that said this morning, there's a side of the story that I believe that needs to be discussed, at very least considered. A side many of us have experienced and still battle with today. And you may wonder why in the world preach this. I mean, you may wonder, why in the world should we focus on the personal life of a tragedy in this manner? And, well, the fact of the matter is this, guys, because it's personal, it is troubling. It is part of what you will experience in life should you choose to follow the footsteps of the younger brother of Luke 15. You know what this is called? And this is what I've earmarked, and I've earmarked it the dark side of the prodigal. We think the events of his life in the far-off country and the riotous living and squandering his inheritance with harlots and all of this different thing, we think that's the dark side, and that was only the, the seed of the dark side. There's a deeper and darker time that came into this young man's life, and may I say to you this morning, it was after the celebration of his return. Prodigal. The word prodigal is defined as spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. That's what the prodigal son is. I mean, how the young man of Luke 15 receives this title is according to verses 13 and 14. You can look there in your, your scriptures in your Bible, and it says, uh, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and, look, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living, verse 14, and when he had spent all. We know the story. We've gone over it for three weeks. So in your mind this morning, I ask you, could he, could he have gone back? 
When did he go back? How often did he go back? What would take him back? What would take him back to those moments? What would be in his life that would take him back to the worst events of his days? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is this. I'm not even referring to him physically going back to a far country, but quite often mentally and emotionally. Well, I'll tell you what would take him back is just that. It's going to be his past. Now, I want you to look in the screen here. I'm not going to have you turn very much until we get to the very close of the sermon this morning. I'm do the work for you today. But I want you to pay attention. You've got to do the work to pay attention. You've, all of you here this morning have done the discipline work of being here, okay? Now you do the work of absorbing it, amen? This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to bear with me here because I'm drawing, a, I'm drawing an illustration to what he says. It says, and you hath he quickened, that means brought back to life, who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Disobedient people and children are walking according to Satan. If you are disobedient to the word of God, you are doing the work and the will of Satan. Let's make it very clear tonight or this morning. All right, make it clear. That's one time, Daisy. I, I got it wrong once already, so let's see if we'll do it twice. Make that clear. We want to say, oh, well, they're just sowing their wild oats. We want to say they're just being themselves. We want to say, oh, they're finding out who they are. I'll tell you who you are. You're walking the course of Satan himself. That's what, There is no gray area. There is no middle ground. If you are a child, it doesn't matter how old you are, a child of disobedience, and you stand in disobedience to the Word of God, you are walking the path of the devil himself. Verse 3, he says, Among whom also we, Paul includes himself, all had our conversation, that conversation means a lifestyle, in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, beloved, Paul mentions there in verse 3, he says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh. He makes it very clear, listen carefully, stay with me on this, there is a memory associated with the past. Even though a soul is saved, born again of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though the soul has repented and returned to their state and restored into, in fellowship of the believers, restored in union with God the Father, it doesn't remove the memory of the past. And many a prodigal today are battling it every single moment, every single morning. Guys, the past is, is bent on bringing shame and guilt into a soul's life. The world desires to apply what we call psychological crutches in order to address this issue. But they never have a solution. As a matter of fact, they make it worse. And, and we need to understand that there are three main causes, say, of depression in the world today. There's only three. There's only three. One, there is, uh, one cause is that of a chemical imbalance. That's physiological, that's not psychological. That is not due to any events in your life, choices by yours or others. Uh, that not, has nothing to do with that at all. It is a chemical imbalance, it is physiological, and it has to be addressed by physiological matters. The other one is, uh, uh, the other one is a, a brain tumor. A brain tumor. Again, physiological. All right? Whereas the one has to be addressed uh, usually chemically, the second one has to be addressed surgically. That's how you would remove that. Those are, the, those are the first two causes of depression in our world today. And the third one is guilt. Whether it's suppressed guilt, whether it's personal guilt, whether it's a, a superimposed guilt, does not matter. That is the third one, and typically it's a result of a concept of unforgiven sins. Guys, if you have a medical problem, guess what? You need to see a medical doctor. However, if your depression or those dealing with it today is a result of sin, you need Jesus Christ in your life. Now, I know it's easy for people to look and say, well, you old preachers, you just like to say, just go get Jesus Christ and everything will be fine. No, it won't. 
I'll be the first one to tell you, you can get saved. Hey, you can, if you're lost and on your way to hell today, you can get saved today. It is probably not going to help one problem that you're currently dealing with right now. It just settles your eternal life. It will give you the power and the means to overcome what you're dealing with, much of what we'll hear by the end of the sermon. But I'm trying to tell you, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross of Calvary, suffer a shameful death in the manner that he did to give us a better life only to go to hell for. Amen. He died to give us eternal life and reunite us with God himself. So the past, guys, rears its ugly head in the prodigal's life. Sin, guilt, and depression is a, pro is a progression. Sin, guilt, and depression is a progression. It begins with a small open door, turning your back and mind away from the foundational truths of the Scripture. Typically, you can hear these telltale signs with this phrase. Well, I believe this. Well, in my opinion, it's such. You know, or, or someone's, you know, and, and that's, believe what the word says and, and, and you'll understand what it means. I'll give you a perfect example, guys. Perfect example of someone doing it their own way, resulting in a sin, and then carrying on with that sin because the past kept rearing its head and only making it worse is Cain, believe it or not. Cain. Genesis 4, verses 1 through 8, gives us this example. We won't turn there for time's sake, but when God rejected Cain's offering, he got all bent out of shape, got his panties in a wad, right? He's all upset. Cain complimented, complicated the matter by responding wrongly to the rejection. He wants to blame God. He got angry and he got depressed. And the Bible tells us that his countenance fell, okay? God warned against the consequences of improper response. He warned made it very clear. He noted Cain's guilt. He noted his anger and his depression. But God graciously said, if thou do as well, shalt, shalt thou not be accepted? There it is, man. If you don't do well, he said, sin lieth at the door. If you want something right, do something right. God also warned that failure to repent and offering the uh, correct sacrifice would cause him to further fall deeper into sin. And guess what happened, guys? That's exactly what happened with Cain's life. Guys, the clutches of sin is like a wild animal. It's crouching at the door, and it's waiting to devour uh, us. But also, when we're looking at Cain, it's waiting to devour him. God offered hope by saying to Cain that he could reverse the downward spiral of sin by breaking out, uh, breaking, uh, breaking out of his sinful pattern through repentance and subsequent change of behavior. Cain failed to heed God's word, fell deeper into the depths of sin, just as God said that he would, and his downward spiral led him to murder his brother Abel. Sin leads to guilt. Sin leads to depression. Sinful handling of sin further complicates matters, leading to greater guilt and deeper depression. Very simple this morning. The past. Beloved, the past has a way to lock onto our hearts and our minds and drag us through a myriad of emotions. Many times it doesn't end with restoration, but sits silent in the corner, waiting for the quiet times, the night of solidarity, the low day or evening time of temptation so that it can spring forward, stirring up guilt in your heart, dragging us into a deeper state of mental and emotional well-being. Even there, guys, is a contrast between the prodigal and Cain. Whereas Cain did not repent, but rather ran down the road of wickedness even further, we still see the human nature. We still see the similarity of guilt and shame in both of them because of personal choices. Beloved, the dark side of the prodigal would be when the past would rear its ugly head. It would remind him of his failure he experienced, the sin he committed, the heartache he caused, the problems brought to his family, the shame to their name. The, the past is problematic. I'll go ahead and tell you that. It's problematic. The reason it's problematic is because the past brings forth pain. It brings forth pain. Now, beloved, the fiery darts of the devil, which cause pain from the past, we find in Ephesians 6, verse 16. Again, doing the work for you, it's up top. Paul says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Again, guys, this is the area we seem to overlook in the prodigal's life the heartache of his own personal suffering. Hey, guys, I understand it was self induced. Don't think that I'm getting up here candy coating it. Don't think that I'm getting up here and saying, well, let's just turn a blind eye to his suffering or a deaf ear to his pain and his irritation. 
I understand that all of which he was dealing with in the wee hours of the night, when everybody went to bed, he's home, high, wide, and handsome, sitting in his bed, nice and comfortable. Hey, he goes back to those moments when he wasted everything that he had. He'll never get back again. And that past starts bringing that pain. It starts sticking him in the heart. It starts reopening these wounds that he caused himself. I'm not overlooking that. That they were self-induced. But can I ask you this? Does that mean it doesn't warrant our attention? Does it mean that it doesn't warrant our interest, our compassion? Not at all. Self-induced or not, guys. This prodigal needs some, some compassion. This prodigal needs some love. He needs some attention. You see, listen, John 10, 10 tells us this. Jesus Christ says, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's why the thief comes. I am come that I might have a life, that they might have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. There's the strong contrast. The devil, the thief, who's robbing you of your joy, robbing you of your happiness, robbing you of your peace. He's bringing up all those things of the past. He's inflicting that pain upon your heart, your soul, your mind. He's bringing all these things up. That prodigal dealt with it every single night. The first quiet time he got, he would hear the snorting of the pigs as he was feeding them. The quiet time he got, he would hear the rebel rousing of all the harlots that he ran around with. He would see that money just begin to dwindle. And when the money was gone, all these so-called friends were gone. And then the family came in, and he ends up in the very, the very filth that he was feeding the pigs with, about to eat their own food. And that comes back to him. The pain that it causes, that he understands that he's supposed to have life more abundantly. That's what Jesus Christ came for. Oh, the thief showed up in that garden that day to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He showed up in that prodigal son. He began to show him that far off country to kill, to destroy, and to steal. Hey, when he dragged him, when he got him convinced that he would go down into that far off country and, and he had all the money that he needed and all these friends that so-called loved him and all these people that are going to make him part of their little clique. All of that began to happen. The thief was just trying to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ wanted to give life more abundantly. So guys, we must recognize and understand that even though the prodigal celebrated his return and restored, there was a residual pain from all of his ill choices he made. And as much as we would love to think differently, guys, it doesn't change the fact of this truth. Because the thief who comes to steal and to kill and destroy uses fiery darts of the wicked to launch them into the hearts of those who are already hurting. And beloved, when the past brings up the pain in your life, Paul tells us, neither give place to the devil. There's a door that has to be shut. There's a, there's a pain, there's a, there's, a, there's a past, it's got to be shaken off. So what's the answer this morning? What's the answer for this dear young brother, this hurting young son, this, this, this kid that made a mess of his life, but came home to daddy, celebrated his return, but we know for a fact he's going to deal with some, some carryover problems in his life because that's human nature, man. You say, well, preacher, I know people that, uh, man, they just haven't blinked, and they came back from that simple lifestyle, and they're this, they're that. I'm going to tell you something. Never mistake, never mistake callousness for righteousness. The Pharisees seared their hearts so the Holy Spirit of God could not, could not enter therein. They seared their conscience so they would not be convicted with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You find someone who has wandered out in the sea of sin, and they're unconvicted. Number one, they're unconverted. Number two, if they sear that conscience, my friend, the Holy Spirit can't get in. So never mistake callousness or apathy for righteousness through repentance. What's the answer for the prodigal son? Well, the prodigal son must persevere. That's just the, that's just the absolute truth. Oftentimes we wonder, how in the world is he going to persevere? Well, the first thing is going to be prayer. Now, before you read the verse, it's already up there. You would probably say to yourself this morning that this young man was in such a state. Where in the world would he begin to pray? Where in the world, would, what would he begin to ask for? As the past continues to prod and the pain begins to open those wounds. Well, we're given an encouragement. Well, there's a, hundreds of verses on prayer, but Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, 
But the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which can not be uttered. You know, there's a time in your life, there may be a time or there may become a time in your life where you're so broken, you're so depressed, you're so down, you're so in the midst of just disillusion with everything that you fall to your knees and you begin to pray and you don't even know what words to say. That's okay. You're in good company. Paul said the same thing in Romans 8, one of the most powerful chapters in all the scripture Romans 8 is. And he says, man, look, for we know not what we should even pray for, but the Holy Spirit helpeth us with our infirmities. Do you know 50% of those 18 to 29 years old believe that prayer and Bible study could overcome mental illness? 50%. We look at people today, we look at young people today, and there's plenty of delinquents around to, 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 to pull from and to use as examples, but there's also plenty of young people between 18 and 29 years old who believe that Bible study and prayer is a way to overcome mental illness. Now, the left and the psychologists, they're not going to agree with that. A right psychologist would. A correct psychiatrist would. An honest physician would. But those who are so caught up in the, the wickedness of this world, they won't. Prayer, my friend. Prayer is the most underutilized tool that we have in the Christian war chest. You know what? Not only through, when you persevere are you going to do so through prayer, but you're going to have to remember the promise. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Again, that's a promise, guys. But lastly, there's a preaching. A Christian cannot grow outside of the house of God in good Bible preaching no more than a plant can grow outside soil. You may think differently. You're wrong. You're not going to grow outside of good Bible preaching. Acts 20, verses 26 through 28 says, Wherefore I take to you record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. He's speaking to preachers. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Getting under... Bible preach, you are not an authority unto yourself, and you are not smarter than the Word of God, nor are you smarter than the man of God. I'm not speaking of myself. I'm speaking of the man that gets behind the pulpit who preaches the Bible for what it is. I don't care what your perverted translations say, they're wrong. It doesn't matter what a, a family member says or what somebody else says. If they go against the Holy Scripture, they are wrong. Amen? You're not going to grow as a Christian today outside, absent of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. A steady diet. No more than you would grow eating one meal a day. One meal a day. Think about it for a second. The body and the spirit are the same, guys. Your, your body's going to grow by eating three, four, five healthy meals a day. And you're going to grow by having consistent, multiple preaching inside the Word of God in your life throughout the week. Getting under Bible preaching in, in a doctrinally sound and loving church where it's what every believer needs. Despite your past, Bible study after Bible study has proven, uh, I'm sorry, study after study has proven uh, that church involvement are associated with better health outcomes, including greater longevity, coping skills, and health-related quality of life, even during terminal illness. There's less anxiety, depression, and suicide amongst those who are avid, regular, regularly involved in church. So do we rejoice with the younger brother coming home? Absolutely, man. You better believe we do. We rejoice with it. We celebrate it. I mean, it's a blessing. It's an encouragement. I mean, uh, his restoration, his removal uh, from the wickedness in the far country. But guys, we must understand that things do not end there. And I believe if we end them there, we end up turning him loose to the animals of this world. His life will not be the same. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be a good life. It does not mean it wouldn't even be a, a great life. But sin has a way to root in, to dig in the soul, wreaking havoc on the young man for years to come. The unseen and many times unaddressed issues of sin causing the mind to go back to yesterday. Yeah, guy, we should rejoice. But we also should remember that there's a dark side of the prodigal missing and filled with the past and pain. So I want to give you an example to this morning, and then we're going to close. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 
We'll do a quick little Bible study here on this chapter, or a few verses on this chapter, and we'll close this morning. 2 Corinthians in chapter 2 is where we're going to look today. Because you may be sitting here thinking now, well, preacher, how in the world? Preacher, uh, I, you know, how do you know that those who go in the past and then therefore repent are still dealing with his residual problems and residual issues? I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And in the margin of your Bible, you can write down 1 Corinthians 5 just in the side because they are co uh, coordinated together. They're references one for another. Verse 1 says, But I determined, with, uh, determined this with myself, that I would not come, watch this, again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who uh, is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which made me, uh, is made sorry by me. Now watch this. Verses 1 and 2 is a direct reference to when Paul wrote the first letter, 1 Corinthians. So stick with me. We'll, we'll read in just a moment. So eyes up here. So when Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians, he had to correct them on loads of things. He had to correct them on the signs, the gifts that were not, are not and were not for the church, uh, the illegitimate speaking in tongues that they were doing, like the gibberish they do up the road. Um, he was correcting them on that, saying That's not, that, that has nothing to do with the church, never has, never, never will be. He said, let all things be decently and in order. He corrected them on missions given, on how to give, all these things, uh, on the doctrine, the Lord's table, all of these things, baptism, all of these things. But then in chapter 5, he addressed a very serious issue of 1 Corinthians, whereas a young man in the church had taken his stepmother as bride. And Paul writes back with great heaviness because the church didn't do anything about it. They said you hadn't put him out, you haven't disciplined him. He's committing a sin, an act that's not even known amongst the Gentiles, amongst the, the pagans out there who are worshiping false gods, who are sacrificing children. They don't even commit this type of act. And he says, I've, I've therefore judged. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, he says, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord. He says, I've turned him over. He's done. He's out of the church. He can live his life the way he wants to, and Satan's going to devour him. He's going to physically die. But his spirit will be saved. That's the great heaviness Paul is referring to now in the second letter. Pick up with me in verse 3. He says, And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, speaking to those in the church, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye, should, that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. He's speaking about the hard decisions and the heartache that he was enduring because of this young man's action and how it was going to uh, hurt them. Verse 5, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I, might, uh, that I may not overcharge anything. You all, sufficient to such a man is the punishment, he's speaking of that young man now, which was inflicted of many. So that contrawise, watch this verse 7, so that contrawise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with, swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Watch in verse 8, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, I'll stop you and go back just a couple of verses. Paul is very adamant here. He says, okay, it's obvious, guys, it's obvious the young man has repented. And changed his actions, his life, his heart, and asked forgiveness. So Paul says, okay, now it's time for you to forgive him, to comfort him. Lest perhaps he's swallowed up with, uh, swallowed up with over much sorrow. Guys, that's that dark side of the prodigal, if you will. That's that dark side that a young man who has repented, returned, and, and needs to be just restored. This is just prior to the restoration. But Paul is, is letting them know, listen, he's going to be swallowed up in over much sorrow if you don't do something right now. He says, I want you to confirm your love toward him. But in verse 9, he makes the key, to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. You know what it was? The point of the church discipline because of his life 
was to bring him back to repentance, and it worked. So now Paul's writing back saying, listen, he's repented. He's, he's returned. He is restored in fellowship. Now what I'm telling you to do is confirm your love toward him. What I'm telling you to do is to confirm, uh, you listen, confirm your forgiveness toward him. And what I'm telling you to do to love this guy, to forgive him, to comfort him, so that he is not overtaken in the, in the sorrow and the darkness of the, the ill choices that he made. So self-induced or not, this prodigal son is going to deal with some issues that he never in his life thought he was. When he went, when he went gone afar, he never in his life imagined that even if he ever returned, he would still deal with a residual sin that is in his life. Now, what is this, a, what is this to those who have never gone out in the sea of sin? This is a shot across the bow. This is a warning to you. You may think you look at others who have dabbled here and dabbled there, and you think, I got enough time, I can come back. And you never, nine out of ten never make it back. And But those who will, and they repent, and they're restored, they return home, there's still going to be a residual pain from the past that's going to make its way clear. And you say, well, preacher, what's the solution? I tell you, I told you, persevere. Does it mean it's going to make it go away altogether? Nope. No, it doesn't. What it does mean is you're going to have to remain steadfast in prayer. You're going to have to remember God's promise. And you're going to have to stay under the Bible preaching of the man of God. That's what it means. And that's the only hope for the prodigal to get through this life in peace. Guys, we need to remember that there's a time that prodigal's heart and his mind, he's, he's going to go back. He's not doing it out of his own choice, out of his own will. He's not doing it because he wants to. He's doing it because of a memory that is there that cannot be removed. And it's going to bring him down to depression. It's going to bring him down emotionally and mentally. And the two things that we can do as believers today, that we can do as family members, as loved ones, is that when they're there and they're dealing with it, we need to recognize it. We need to help them. We need to love them. We need to have compassion with them. Understanding that they're human nature, men of like passion as we are. And they're going to deal with this in their life despite the repentance. Yeah, gone back? Absolutely. In his mind and his heart. As painful as it is, the past rears its ugly head because of the fiery darts of the wicked. But it's the perseverance going to get the prodigal through. It's the perseverance that is going to make a difference in his life, thus making a difference in the lives of others. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be here this morning. I pray that you take this message and write it upon our hearts, dear God. I pray that we would soon not forget it, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to stand in, in your pulpit, this sacred desk, dear God, to preach the precious word of God. And I simply ask you today to help us and guide us and lead us through the right way. Help us put aside any private interpretation or opinion toward the scriptures and help us today dig and trust your every word that it is inspired, perfect, and pure, just like you would have us to have it. It is inerrant, it's without contradiction and without void. So Lord, I do love you and I do thank you for who and what you are. I ask you to bless the rest of this day to thy holy name. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope and pray the sermon you just heard was a tender blessing to your heart and to your soul. I hope that it gives you the encouragement, edification to face the challenges that we see each and every day and week throughout our life. I'd like to invite you out to one of our live services here at Saren Chapel in Abraman. We are located on Lewis Street as well as Davis Street. Davis Street is the entrance to our chapel and as well as Lewis Street is the entrance to our hall and you can use either one of them. But secondly today, guys, I would like to share just a brief message to you now to ask you to where you are going in eternity. If today was the last day you were alive, if today, by some tragedy, this was the last moment you had on this earth, when you closed your eyes, would you wake up and see Jesus Christ? It is a simple question, guys, and it is even a more simple answer. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid the ultimate price for mankind. He gave us the free pass to eternal life by giving his life on the cross of Calvary, being buried into that grave, but rising again on the third day. It is simple as this. 
The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, guys, while we were sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much that he gave his life. As a matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. But what happened was the payment with, for mankind is death. Romans 6, 23 clearly tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you today, what would, what would stop you right here, right now, from bowing your head and saying a prayer much like this, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you stepped up out of the grave to give us victory over sin and victory over death. I invite you into my heart and ask forgiveness of my sins and ask you to lead God and direct me throughout the rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. You say that prayer in your own words, but you have to say it and believe in it. Remember, Romans 10, 9 says, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is a promise from the word of God. That is a promise from God himself. That is the promise from the creator of all things, that if you'll believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, ask forgiveness of your sins, accept his free gift and pardon of sin into your heart today, that you will be born again, that you will have eternal life in heaven. Guys, I hope and pray this is a blessing to you today. I hope and pray that you'd make that decision. And if you have, if you've made that decision today, let us rejoice with you. Come by and see us here at the church or hit us up online at any of the social media outlets or through email or however you can. Just share with us the glorious transformation that you just received in your life. Guys, I hope to see you soon in the house of God. Hope to see you soon right here in Sharon Chapel. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. God bless.